Dr. Arafat, it's good to see you again. Hi, uh, how are you? Very good. Nice of you to come out on a Saturday. I don't think you have too many uh, free days to- This is the out. third video conference today, so don't worry. We are, it was a busy day today. Okay, well, thanks again for coming. It's about Thank six you. months since we saw each other, remember? Back in September, and it was quite yeah. a different time. So I guess the first question for viewers in the United States and also here in Romania, how goes the battle? Well, uh, we are on two fronts. The front that I deal with principally, which is the COVID impact. We are now not in a good situation. The numbers are increasing. We are uh, now at about 5,000 cases a day and the intensive care units are becoming full not only the intensive care units, but also the, the intermediate cases, as we call them, the high dependency, the ones who need oxygen and so on. Mm -hmm. So we are looking now and we are, uh, we are monitoring the situation. We transfer patients from areas to, uh, to other areas and so on. So we're working, it's like we were in November, October, November, December in that time. Yeah. So this is the situation there on the side of the vaccination. I would say that it's going on well. We have around 1,300,000 yesterday vaccinated. Excellent. Yes. Uh, yeah, about 600,000 are with their second dose already taken. And the problem is, uh, of course, the issue with the AstraZeneca, but uh, from what my colleagues are telling me, uh, the, though the people were worried because of the uh, batch that had a problem or possibly had a problem because there is no proof yet that uh, uh, it is what happened was caused by the vaccine. Still, that batch was taken out and uh, some people withdrew from the vaccination, but the same number re registered and came in to vaccinate themselves. I so see, see. From, this, from this point of view, it seems that people are going on, uh, they have confidence, so they are going to vaccinate and so on. The mass media is, as always, creating a big discussion around the AstraZeneca issue. And this, of course, may, make some people worried or uh, uh, make them withdraw at least for the moment from vaccination. But we hope that this will stop because a lot of people are giving opinions without being yeah, really- Yeah, we, uh, we all have that problem. Let me back you up to what you said at the beginning that you know it's become sort of like October once again and uh, certain cities hit harder than others. Why do you think that's happened? Well, it's, uh, it's clear that uh, some people relax themselves much more than they should. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a good situation in, uh, in uh, January. We started having less cases and so on. So people thought that we passed through the critical point and uh, uh, we won't come back to a critical situation again. Of course, yeah. there is the vaccination, which made people have more hope but at the same time some people were thinking that if you vaccinated already a few hundred thousand people then it's no problem which is untrue because we need to vaccinate at least uh, a few million people until we see the impact that other countries have seen uh, romania is going uh, very well on the vaccination issue better than many other countries in the eu but still we need to go to that number which is calculated by us to be around 10 million people vaccinated. I see. I mean, going back to our last conversation, I asked you the question about, are you confident that Romania will have the vaccines? And you said, yeah, it's been, it's working through Brussels and everybody had an allocation. And, but it seems like it's moving more slowly in the Western part of Europe than here. And it's certainly moving better in England and in the United States and in Israel. What's going on in Europe? Why isn't getting it out faster? I, I really don't know. I think it depends on how every country is organizing it. In Romania, we divided the, the coordination between uh, two major entities. Yeah. The Ministry of Interior, the Department for Emergency Situations is dealing yeah. with the issue of the disease itself, uh, yeah. together with the Ministry of Health, of course. Yeah. And the Ministry of Defense is dealing with the issue of the vaccination 
in cooperation with our department, we have personnel working with them and in cooperation with the Ministry of Health. So it was a national coordination. And yeah. the whole thing went, went on as a national approach, not sending the vaccines to local places and telling them, okay, you deal with it, you plan your vaccinations and so on. So there is a national platform to subscribe on it. There is a national monitoring. There is a national monitoring of the vaccines. There is a national distribution plan of the vaccines. So this, I think, helped a lot in Romania to make the, the, the things work better than yeah. giving the vaccines to regions or to small areas and telling them, okay, manage it yourself. And is the vaccine getting out evenly around the country or the cities have the advantage or how, how's that working? And so the no, that no, it is the vaccine is being sent uh, in, a, in an equal way. The areas which are more affected, we are trying to vaccinate more people faster there. Right. Right. So the areas which have more cases, we try to, to vaccinate more people in this period. But right. that doesn't mean that the other areas are neglected. We had some problems, of course, with the delays that we had from the right. Pfizer. But now these problems are sorted out. Romania even donated some doses of vaccines to Moldova in, in the last uh, three weeks. Uh, like the president said that uh, we will donate 200,000 doses to Moldova. The first 20 doses already went there. Yeah, so, from this, so from this point of view, I would say that the approach is national. It is not biased for one city or the other or so on. And you're saying, so you're basically saying a pretty good job. And how about as far as elderly people, I, the elderly people being looked after the way they are usually in most parts? of the world, are they getting the vaccine sooner? <laughs> they, they have, yes, well, there have been three steps. The first step was the medical people. Then the second step started very fast after that with the over 65 yeah. uh, and with those who are below 65, but who have comorbidities. Uh, starting on the 15th of March, it will be general approach. That means general. everybody. Whilst those who cannot be mobilized, there, there were mobile teams going to vaccinate them, like in the elderly homes and so on. There were mobile teams to do the vaccinations there. And how come it's the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine that seems to be taking the lead on Moderna and other ones that are coming up? Like Johnson Johnson was just approved. But does it seem like Pfizer is more effective or cheaper? Or what is it about Pfizer? Mm, no, I don't think that it has to do anything that it is cheaper or so on. Yes, people know from the details and so on that it is more effective than the AstraZeneca for by certain percentages, and we know this all. Different technologies, some people, in fact, they prefer to be vaccinated by AstraZeneca, which is the classical way of vaccination, you know, with the attenuated virus, yeah. with the, yeah, whilst, other people have more confidence and they want to be vaccinated with the Pfizer, which is with the mRNA, which is a new technology. So I think that from this point of view, people are, are willing to be vaccinated and they know that there is not much to choose because yeah. those who plan themselves for the vaccination, they, they, they plan themselves according to the uh, vacant slots of course yeah. they know what they will be vaccinated with if they don't want that they don't plan themselves until there is a slot opening for the other vaccine that they want i see and in the case of the vaccines it's free of charge obviously no one pays anything is that right no one pays anything it's free of charge from all points of view so it, the government of nobody romania pays anything the government Sorry? the government of romania of course has to pay i know of that course what is a vaccine cost by the way we don't really know exactly. These are all confidential data on the costs yeah, because it is all coming through the EU. I see. And I see. there are confidential data on this. Even if we know it, we cannot come out and discuss it and so on. Yeah. On the costs, these have been contracts between the, the various companies right. and the EU and with distribution to the EU countries. So mostly we are accessing the vaccines that have been contracted by all the EU member states and distributed accordingly with the number of the citizens in each country. 
Uli, you were saying that the media sometimes twists the story a little bit. And we've seen that all over the world. And I noticed in Israel, there's some statistics where out of 100,000 who were treated, the number that had seriously adverse things was 3.5. In other words, an entirely negligible number. And exactly. So and most of, most of the side effects, if not nearly all of them, are not to worry about. There were some allergic reactions, but mostly they were passing, uh, uh, let's say, uh, temporary side effects like fatigue, like some uh, uh, muscle ache or so on, but which passed. But the, the idea is that there are the groups, what we call them the anti-vaxxers, that you have them everywhere. Yeah. When, whenever there is, for example, a death which is happening a few days after somebody was vaccinated, even if it has nothing to do with it, and yeah. the autopsy shows that it has nothing to do with it, they yeah. try to convince people that this is happening because of the vaccination. I was comparing Romania with the Netherlands because they're about the same population. And I actually saw that the performance historically, Romania was doing better than the Netherlands. And certainly Romania is less shut down even now, but less shut down than France, less shut down than Spain, less shut down than England, less shut down than Italy. How did, you, how did, how did, how did that happen? The measures we take, we, we are less shut down, but we have certain measures. We have two thresholds. The threshold, which is uh, beyond 1.5 per thousand in a town or in a city or so on. The threshold, which is beyond three per thousand. And this is how we take uh, our, uh, we apply certain restricted measures, but without total lockdown. Yeah, Except we quarantine areas, but even the areas that are quarantined, it doesn't mean you have to stay only at home. Yeah, but there are some activities which are even less, uh, less, uh, let's say, open or so on. But yeah. it is all depending on that area. For example, now we have 22 areas which are under quarantine. The only large city that is under quarantine at this moment is Timisoara which we put it under quarantine last week after a lot of debate with the local authorities, but we put it under quarantine. And I think that we stopped the increase of the cases. It was in the city of Timisoara already uh, going up to 7.7 per thousand. Now it plateaued at 7.06 around there. I'm sure we will start seeing it dropping in the next period. So uh, this is what, how we approached it. Of course, uh, this has the good side, the bad side of it. Uh, even though the, the uh, yeah, restaurants, let me take it like this, restaurants, bars, things like this, they are completely closed if it comes to areas which go beyond three per thousand. Yeah, like in- And this is, this is automatic closure. I see. Uh, yeah, but of course, uh, even though we have a lot of people unhappy about the measures that we take and they think that we are very restrictive, we try to explain to them. Uh, for example, we have the hour of curfew, which is 2200 uh, compared to France, which is 1800. For yeah, example. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I think one of the things that I've noticed before, and maybe it has to do with your background, you're a highly pragmatic man. In other words, I remember you explaining last time that we move people by helicopter, by ambulance to try to, this is in the treatment period. And this element of being practical and pragmatic, do you think that's one thing that gave you an advantage in dealing with the, with the pandemic in Romania? Yeah, yes, I think that moving people around, it gave us an advantage. At the same time, we used mobile intensive care units, which we attached them to hospitals. Yeah. Uh, each unit would have about 12 beds, 8 to 12 beds. We have five of them. We moved them to areas which were highly affected. Now, for example, in Bucharest, we have one which is working. We brought a second one to increase the number of the intensive care beds that it will start functioning uh during the next week so we try to do this at the same time some containers were built for uh for the um, uh the for the intensive care beds increase right. and these are containers which are near the hospital completely connected to it they are very well they are they look like any hospital inside 
but these yeah. were container, containerized and they could be built very fast. I see. Uh, so we increased the the number of uh, of uh, of the intensive care beds. At the same time, uh, we uh, we also worked on increasing the number of ventilators, the number of non-invasive ventilation ventilators, to drop the the the, the stress on the intensive care units. And we worked a lot on moving personnel, which is many countries couldn't do that. We, we really did it. You mean moving personnel, doctors, nurses? Yes, for example, we have an intensive care unit where it has five doctors. One of the doctors goes out because he becomes sick or so on. Yeah. We find another intensive care unit which has 10 doctors and we take one and we move him there yeah. by order of, of, the, of the coordinator, as we say. And this can happen anyway nationally. We pay them more for that. We send them there for about one month until somebody else comes and replaces them. We use doctors. We did this with nurses, with doctors. We did this with intensivists, with emergency doctors, with infectious disease doctors, with pulmonology doctors, and with radiologists. We moved them between entities, between units where we needed them even between cities and from one end of the country to the other end. Some of them were not happy of this, but uh, they went to court. Most of them, they lost because we put this in the law that we can do that, even right. if you are hired by a certain hospital. Very good idea. It seems like a very sensible idea. Speaking of the big picture, I turn to the United States. In the United States, we have about 20% almost that have had a vaccine or the first vaccine. And we have about 30% um, that have had COVID. I, since I saw you, I got COVID. Did you catch COVID yourself? No. No. But succeeded you not to have it. Now I'm vaccinated. Yeah. So I hope even if I would have it, it would be easy. Right. I see. Well, so the question is if you add the people who've had COVID and you add the people who've had the vaccine in the United States, that comes to about 40% right now. So we're getting closer to that herd immunity idea. How do you see those matrix moving in Romania in terms of number of people being vaccinated all the time, number of people who had COVID and now for a while won't get, won't get sick? The, the, problem, the problem with the people who got COVID, except for not a large number, small, except for a small number who still have antibodies and who had, let's say, the intermediate form or the severe form to build up an antibodies that would stay, you know, yeah. and that will have an impact for at least a few months. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, the issue comes again to the vaccinated people. I mean, the herd immunity, or let's say the large number immunity would come from the vaccination, That's not it. necessarily from those who had the disease. Even those who had the disease, we, convince, we try to convince them, and many of them do it, which is to vaccinate themselves in maximum 90 days from the time they... Uh, they were considered as healed from 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 the COVID. Ninety days, not so just three yeah, months. This is so three months, and so the immunity with the vaccine lasts is better than long. the one with the yeah. Do you want to take a chance to say how long that would last? I don't. I don't know. Nobody knows the vaccine how much it would last. I mean, we know now that it still lasts. You yeah. know, there are studies. This is not yeah. a vaccine which which was studied for years. Yeah. to know for how long its yeah. immunity is uh, is guaranteed. But we all know that there may be a possibility at a certain moment to need a third vaccine shot, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe to, to be an adapted shot also to include the new uh, variants of the, of the virus, you know. Mm -hmm. So we all know that there may be a possibility that next year or sometime there will be needed another shot, but this already, this is, let's say, still is under discussion. Nobody can say if it will be like this or not. Well, taking, taking what you're saying there about cold people who've had COVID and also the length of the vaccine, you might be skeptical about this green passport idea in Israel, which is being used in Israel to go now into bars and go into restaurants, so you can show evidence that you've, uh, you've had the shot. But what you're saying, that would be rather difficult to move at an international level, at a free movement around the world, because people are taking vaccines at different, different times. Maybe some of those vaccines last longer than others. What's your view of this green passport scheme? 
the, the problem is we promised uh, in order to convince everybody that this is not something, uh, it, it is not a big conspiracy, you know, and so on. We promised all of us in Europe, not only Romania, that this vaccine will be voluntary. And it is a voluntary vaccine. Yeah. At the same time, uh, the promise was not to discriminate. So from medical point of view, yeah. we, we use the vaccination certificate as uh, a motivation for not to quarantine some persons that are coming into Romania. So yeah. if you show your vaccination certificate, or if you show the certificate that you had the disease in the last 90 days, but of course not the last 14 days, then you can come in and not be current, uh, not going to quarantine. But yeah. this is the only thing we do. We are not expecting, and I know even politically that the president and everyone said that we will not be uh, applying rules like if you show your certificate, you go to the bar. If you don't have it, you don't go to yeah. the bar and so yeah. on. Because this then will create two classes of citizens and yeah. it will create a problem. And in a way, it is forcing others to vaccinate themselves, which takes the voluntary uh, aspect of vaccination from a step to another, let's say. So how this many, is why we are, uh, we are reluctant to do this. How many people are afraid of the vaccine, if you could give a percentage to them, that they just don't seem like they want to do it? No, we, we had some, some polls that were done, and we know that there are about 24 to 30 percent who would never do the vaccine. They don't want it. They 30%. are 30%. between 25 and 30 percent. Yes, that was at least uh, the last poll I read, which was about two months ago. I, these things may change, of course. People yeah. may change their opinions. I'm not aware of recent polls on that, but we know that there were people who were sure that they will vaccinate. There were people who were still unsure, but they were watching it. And there were people who said, we will never do it. You know? And those who said that they will never do it, they were about one quarter uh, to 30% of the population. Yeah. So um, has the president taken a vaccine? Are the leaders? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The president, the prime minister, the ministers, and we all did it public. I mean, I myself yeah. also did it public because this was a way to convince people that we are, we are doing it. Of course, like I saw in the States with, uh, with the president and the vice president, uh, yeah. Kamala Harris, when they vaccinated themselves, there were a lot of talks that, in fact, this is just a fake. It is not the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. yeah and so on. The same thing happened here. Some people, which are the anti-vaxxers, were coming out and saying, yes, but how do we know that this is really the, the vaccine? How do we know that this is not the simple serum? But these were not so effective as propaganda. People yeah. saw yeah. us vaccinated, and I think that this encouraged many people to vaccinate themselves. You said early in this conversation that you're a little concerned about the role of the media and how the media tries to keep the, a story alive and maybe keep the ratings up or keep people, you know, on edge. In a way, you could say the media has helped and the media has hurt. On balance, how do you see it? Do you see it, they were helpful at the beginning and are dragging it out, or how do you see that? Uh, let's not generalize, because I don't think the whole media treated it in the same way. Yeah. At the beginning, everyone was helpful because everyone was afraid and because yeah. they didn't know what it is all about. Yeah. But slowly we had polarization. We had yeah. media which kept a mainstream in uh, uh, talking about it uh, cautiously, uh, bringing the real experts to talk to and so on. We had part of the media which started bringing those who are against and uh, exposing them more than any other experts yeah. and exposing their opinions and so on. And uh, I think that this is where we are. I mean, we see our, the, the bad issue is that people are not always following that part of the media which is telling them quietly what it is all about and how is yeah. the situation. They are more interested in uh, debates which uh, have some, you know, a little bit of conspiracy, a little bit of lies, a little bit of issues, you know, politics. And I think that Romania also had a big problem in the fact that last year we had uh, uh, campaigns, electoral campaigns, the parliament, the local authorities and so on, 
And the COVID issue became a big political discussion, which was wrong, but it happened. This is how it went on. And yeah. I think that uh, this all uh, was not a very good thing. And I think that it even uh, had a very bad impact on the society. I mean, we can see that now we have uh, more outspoken extremists and outspoken uh, racist comments that you could not see them before in Romania. In Romania, these were very unusual. Now we, saw, we see them uh, on social media, we see them uh, even spoken uh, publicly, you know, and so on. And I think that this has to do with all these issues, uh, trying to convince people that somebody is trying to trick them and to control them and so on. So I think this is all over the world. It's not only in Romania. I think it is quite a general phenomenon. I mean, going back to the vaccine a sec, I noticed the Hungarians took the Sputnik vaccine from Russia. Given the fact that we all would have wanted more vaccines sooner, did you ever consider, or did the Romanian government ever consider taking the Russian uh, uh, vaccine? I'm not aware of any discussion that we took into consideration this. We took into consideration what the EU approached and we went together with the EU approach and yeah. with those vaccines that are authorized by the EU, by and the Medi Medi uh, you know, the European Medication Agency, the EMA. Right. And um, now we have Johnson & Johnson in the game, approved in the United States, the one shot. Do you think that will help uh, convince the doubters who don't want two shots, or do you think that will help the situation? What's your thought on that? I'm sure it will do this, and I'm sure it will make things easier because some people will will like the idea that it's only one shot and that's it. Yeah. So yes, once it is approved by the EMA, I don't know if it was still approved by the European Medication Agency, but once it's approved, we will start getting the doses because there is also a European contract for a certain quantity from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Yeah, I know there are all these new categ there are categories of people, obviously the elderly and the media, and I hear lawyers. Do you sometimes feel that there's too many sort of specialized groups? I hear of young people going out and getting it here and there all the time. You, it's, it's what you'd say in the United States, you know, jumping the queue. Uh, do you think some, in, in terms of distribution, there's a bit of that issue that people are jumping the queue a little bit, jumping ahead? But that was a discussion in Romania, and we don't have any, any proof that this happened largely. But of course, maybe in some points, in some areas, yeah. some person jumped the queue. Nobody can exclude this anywhere in the world, in fact, let's yeah. say. Uh, and we cannot come and say we guarantee 100% that no one did it, but there was a clear mechanism not to allow this to happen. At the yeah. same time, uh, we didn't want to, to throw away any doses. So yes, in some centers, when they remained with, uh, at the end of the day with certain doses that nobody came from those who were planned, then they vaccinated other people who were willing to be vaccinated, even if they were not really in yeah. that group. So this was done in order not to lose the doses at the end of the day. And this is mainly with the Pfizer vaccine. I see. In terms of the vaccines um, and the concern about them, one thing is the variants, you know, the, the variant that we had in uh, South Africa and in Brazil. Uh, but there's an item in the New York Times today, which I saw that they said the vaccines are effective against all variants out there. Do you share what I thought was a fairly optimistic interpretation of that? That well, we all know that there is. We all know that the vaccines are efficient. We don't yeah. know if they are efficient equally for all the variants. This is yeah. the difference. Yeah. So maybe some variants, uh, the efficiency is not as high as it was for the predominant one when the vaccines were, were developed. But yeah. until now, we know that the efficiency of the vaccines covers the variants that exists at this moment. This is the, 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 the information we have until now. Well, that's good news. That's very good news. One thing we have, uh, uh, know many people have kids in school here in Romania, and I guess grades five, and five to 12, when do you think, and I know it's difficult for you to predict, when do you think they can go back to a normal school schedule? A lot of mothers here, and people around the world are always con concerned about that. What's your guess? Can you make a guess? 
Well, now you know that we opened the schools, but we have the scenarios where if you go beyond three per thousand, then we stay with the final classes and with the first four plus the preschoolers, as we say. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, in the areas where it is a green scenario, it is yeah. completely open. In the yellow scenario, it is uh, a different uh, different approach, and there the schools can be hybrid or can be fully open, or you know, not everybody is going. The, yeah. the idea is that we will go on with these scenarios for a while, I think, until we get to no restrictions at all. It will be combined with the vaccine success and the number of the vaccinated people. So I think that for the next, at least now, what I would say. This we will see how it evolves. That for the next two months or something like this, three months, we will still go on the scenarios we have now. Right, I see. I mean, the, the president the other day of the United States said that uh, he is cautious, usually being quite cautious. A few weeks ago, he said it'd be by the end of the summer, we should be back to normal. He set a target by May 1, everybody should be able to have a vaccine, there should be sufficient vaccines. Um, he said that for July 4th, you know, the American Independence Day, we can get together and so forth. Uh, do you think that, you know, Children's Day in June, we'll see an opportunity to that. Is there any moment where you can hold up as a point of optimism where the Romanians can say, ah, uh, or is that too risky to do at this point? I think it's too risky to give dates. Yeah. I usually don't like giving dates because sometimes you may be proven wrong and then you have to explain yeah. why you said it, you know? So I would say that for the next two to three months, we know that these scenarios will go on. Let's yeah. see after that what happens. This is what I would say now, but I wouldn't give dates because we don't know how things will evolve. We don't know the variants, how they will evolve. We don't know if anything new will happen, you know? So right. we, we, we need to keep a little bit cautious here. I know that you're watching a crisis and dealing with it day in and day out, and I find it remarkable the the intensity that must, you must be dealing with all the time, never ending. But I've noticed another kind of, of uh, intensity, and that is dealing with the psychological effects of being home. We, in fact, have a lot of employees in the city and around the country, and some have been at home for now almost a year. Have you ever looked at this psychiatric impact of this kind of a isolation, this sort of Zoom living, this sort of cut off from the world, uh, does that concern you? Of course, there is an impact on the psychological aspect. Nobody can deny this. I mean, you can go for a while like this, but uh, we are not used to this type of living, you know. Uh, and the danger also is on the children is that in the future, they might like this way and be in a way uh, not very social afterwards, you know, if yeah. they are growing in this way of, of living, you know, Zooming and work and playing with the smartphone and so on. So this is an issue. I won't say that I myself or my people, we looked at it because this is an issue which mostly the Ministry of Health will be looking at it. There are discussions about it. I'm not aware of any special actions at this moment. Yeah. You described early in the conversation a strategy where you have different strokes for different folks. Timisoara is tough. We got to deal with Timisoara. There are parts of Romania that, you know, probably are a lot better off. And I'm sure you look at it, Judets by Judets. Same thing in the United States, where, for instance, in Texas, the mask has been dropped. So, you know, you have 16 states now out of 50 that don't have a mask requirement. I guess the danger there is that it can create a feeling of, hey, you know, the good times have happened. But in the, so where, where do you stand on that particular issue? If there's a part of Romania, but not, or who knows where, where it's relatively easy, would you be tempted to say, hey, over there, no mask, we can do something else? No, I think that at this moment, the approach to the mask in the public areas will be a national one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we will continue dealing with it as a national approach, not a local approach. There are issues which we deal with them locally, but there are issues which we deal with them nationally as measures. And the mask measure will be a national one. It will be very hard to control if we start breaking it into local measures. So right. at this moment, this is how it is. Keep it national, keep it nationwide. Yeah. I mean, every country, I suppose, has a different road to dealing with this. 
As I said earlier, I think what Rom Romania has done has been remarkably successful in keeping an element of freedom compared certainly to what we've seen in Western Europe. So that's a plus. I'm sure there's enormous tension, obviously from the economic community, the bars, the restaurants, the hotels, and all those people. How much are you involved with dealing with the economic argument or faced or people going to you and pressuring you say, Rayed, you have to let up on this, on the, on this thing because you're coming up with this. Well, pressuring, I think that uh, the involvement is very high because everybody will be calling, everybody wants to discuss and everybody wants to say, okay, let's uh, drop the things and we need to have the big uh, festivities, we need to have untold happening in Cluj, you know, we need to have Never See happening in Constanza and so on. And here my answers are very clear. It is early, we don't know, and we will wait and see. Right. And we cannot, and we cannot, and in fact, I said it clearly because we know that this is a big issue. I said it openly, be careful, don't start organizing things which will cost you a lot of money so that afterwards you will say, give us the money that we spent. Yes. Because this is, oh, this is still too early, you know, on these issues. On the other hand, on the economical issues, it's mostly the prime minister, the minister of economy and the minister of finance that are dealing with this. But we cannot say that when we are taking our decisions to suggest a measure to the National Committee of Emergency Situations, which is headed by the Prime Minister, uh, that we take into consideration also the economical impact of the measures we suggest. Because we have a group of people that we meet before, we call it the technical scientific group, which is a consultative group for the National Committee for, the, for Emergency Situations. And that group has epidemiologists, has specialists in it and so on. And we look also at the issue if the measure is worth it or if it will be more of a bad economical impact without any, uh, let's say, uh, real impact on fighting the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Right, I see. You said there, wait and see. And actually, you've now seen a lot. I mean, we, Biden chose Thursday as a year, the year anniversary, well, who knows exactly what the year anniversary is. Is there anything that you'd say with the passage of time and the knowledge that you've gained and the insights that, geez, I wish we did this differently? Of course, there would be some things that maybe we should have done them faster or yeah. maybe we shouldn't have done them. I mean, but it doesn't mean that that, that was a mistake because yeah. if we take our our major lockdown, let's say, in during the state of emergency at the beginning. Yeah. And now we are in a worse condition, but we are not taking the major lockdown. It doesn't mean that, sorry, it was a mistake then. But yeah. then we knew less. We took certain measures. Now we know more. So yeah, we right. deal in a different way. This is what I would say. So we always analyze what we did. And of course, from what we learned, we, we take our measures in maybe in a different way. This is how some measures we retained them because we know that they worked. For example, the local quarantination of, of areas, it worked very well with some few exceptions. Wherever we applied the quarantine on an area and we limited the movement in that area from within it outside or you know or from outside in and so on at the end whether it was two weeks or three weeks or some areas four weeks we succeeded to drop significantly the incidents to a very low number so i think that this was one of the things that encouraged us not to take general measures from that point of view but to take them locally by areas or by towns or by cities under Donald Trump and with the World Health Organization, there's still an open discussion about, you know, what was the cause? Where did this happen? If you listen to some, they'd say it was the live markets in China. If you listen to others, including some French scientists, apparently, Luc Montagnier, it was the, a, a leak from the Wuhan labs. Do you think that question is resolved? Do you think you, do you have a clear answer in your own mind that you know how this all started because it ties into the question of could it happen again? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that I have a clear idea in my mind that I don't know if anyone has it. And those who have it, maybe they are not saying it yet, or I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, 
we had the Spanish flu about 100 years ago, yeah. exactly 100 years ago. Yeah. And there was no lab from where that virus would escape yeah. and so on. So these are things that happen in the nature. So if there is no solid proof that this is something human made, let's say, then we have to accept the idea that this is an evolution issue which happened. Maybe the live market is a, a theory that we can go for, but uh, we must be expecting other events like this in the future. I mean, I would say that this is not the end of it. It doesn't mean that we will have another 100 years until a new virus comes and starts a new uh, pandemic. Yeah. We've, seen, we've seen the Ebola virus, how it changed yeah. its behavior. And after it stayed with local effects for a long time, then it hit three countries at the same time and created a lot of problems within 2014, 2015, sometime you know, very, very near to, to, to today. Yeah. So from the point of view, we have to keep preparing for the future and we have to expect in the future that such problems may reappear. I see. The idea is to learn from what we have done, to learn from what we have seen, to understand that we were wrong not to take these things seriously because we were talking about this for a while. I mean, myself yeah. and my staff, we worked on this and we know that the first time we warned seriously that nobody is prepared ourselves was during the Romanian presidency in February last year. And we even have a report which is written, which was given to the EU uh, at the end of the presidency. And we used it in Romania and many other countries which participated in an exercise. And we said, we don't have stockpiles. We don't have this, we don't have that. Uh, we are not very well prepared. And I think that it's clear that what we see now is what we saw during our exercise. Yeah. And I think that the, if we are wise, as a collectivity, as a big number of people, uh, different countries and so on, we have to prepare much better and take it, take it seriously and understand that no one can deal with this alone. Yeah. This yeah. has to be a, a, a worldwide effort. This has to be a worldwide preparedness. Those who cannot do it must be helped to do it. Those who don't have the money to prepare must be helped to prepare. Because if one area is not well prepared to prevent or to deal with these issues, it will impact the whole world. That's clear. A very good point. Well, I, I thank you for that. I mean, that's, it's, I thought, sobering advice. And it's, you, of course, must have been engaged both you know, in a physical way in terms of being involved with all logistics, but also intellectually in trying to understand how grave this is. I just want to see if we have a couple of questions. You're very nice. I know it's a Saturday, but uh, Rilu, Relika, are you there with any questions from the States? Yes, um, absolutely. Thank you, John. Um, we have several questions and um, I'm going to select one that seems to, you know, hit a lot of interest because people are interested in travel. Um, and Elena Nitsa is asking, can people that will not want to vaccinate be restricted on entering in uh, Romania? And um, Elena is also asking if um, are, is any, are, is anybody working on finding some medication or treatment for the coronavirus? And if not, uh, instead of a vaccine, and if not, why not? Well, uh, the, I will start with the end of it. Of course, there are scientists working on treatments, not only on the vaccine itself. But uh, this is harder maybe to, to, to find and treatments need to be tested and so on so that you say this is a treatment for the vaccine, for the, for the SARS-CoV-2. So, but there is work on this and we know that there is work and there are a lot of debates about certain drugs like the Evermectin and, and so on. Now, uh, the point on restricting people from traveling or coming if they are not vaccinated, no. But uh, those who are not vaccinated may go to quarantine if they are coming from certain areas. Those who are vaccinated will not go to the quarantine. This is a medical measure. This is a public health measure. So this is what will happen. But no one will restrict people from traveling if they are not vaccinated. A couple more questions, just not to go too much over the hour. Waluka? Okay. 
um, let's see, give me one second. I hope this is your last Zoom call of the day. Today, yes. Tomorrow we have a big program and even with the prime minister and so on, because we okay. will start analyzing the situation and so uh, again. So it will be a lot of- read this one. It's a little bit longer. Um, hi, Michael Guest here in California. Nice to see you again. And thank you for, as always, your important work. Uh, uh, former ambassador. Likewise. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, in the U.S., beyond vaccines, most discu discussion of COVID is about families and economic livelihoods, how to run small businesses effectively, to shop for groceries, and so on. Do you have an advisory committee of businesses to offer input on these types of issues? And when, what benchmarks are you using to determine when conditions might allow restrictions to loosen safely? I wouldn't say that, at least not myself. I'm not involved in such in such uh, advisory groups or so on. I'm sure that the businesses have a lot of discussions and we know that there are groups that request meeting with us, which we met with, or meeting with the prime minister, especially on the economical issues, which where I myself not directly involved. So I would say that, yes, the, the business society is, or the business uh, uh, people are always uh, being active in trying to find solutions. Uh, some of these solutions are okay. Some solutions maybe are yet not for this moment, but may become okay for the future to, to, to loosen the things a little bit more. But there are ongoing discussions at the level of the government and with us on certain issues. And we discussed several times, especially with the hospitality industry and so on, where we had discussions with them, but uh, not always we could give them the, the answers they were expecting from us. This is, this is the issue. But there are discussions, yes, and there are debates on the future and on how we are going to come back to normality, as we say. Good. So, the, so it's, uh, it's not, it's right up at your level, this kind of discussion is going on right in front of your eyes. No, I, I think and it is, it is correct because this is why there is a prime minister and there is a secretary of state dealing with yeah. certain issues, you know, and so on. So yeah. I think that the economical issues, there are at least two ministries dealing with that and finding solutions. And there is the EU level also, let's not forget it, where the prime minister and the two ministers and even the president, of course, they are involved at that level to find solutions for the economy and for supporting the economy. Yes. So from my point of view, I'm dealing more with the immediate emergency situation, as we say, and, uh, and with its impact uh, from certain points of view, but not necessarily the economical point of view. Though, as I said, when we suggest decisions, we look also at this issue ourselves. But the economical uh, and the, the 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 economical support to the business uh, society and the business people is coming from other area, and there are other people dealing with it. I see. We'll look at one more. Just uh, keeping yeah. our eye on the time. Yeah, um, we have another question from Sheila Cast. Uh, welcome, Sheila. Thank you for your question. Um, Easter is such a big festivity in Romania. What special message are you delivering to Romanians about celebrating Easter? Well, this, this is being used a lot of the mass media yet. We hope that they will be able to celebrate Easter much better than last year. But of course, we will communicate about it in the near future. And of course, with the discussion with the prime minister and with everyone, depending on how the pandemic situation is, there are no intentions to block people from celebrating it or so on. But uh, at the same time, as we said, uh, we don't give answers long time before, so we will stay and see how things are evolving. Terrific. Well, uh, Doctor, I have to thank you again for taking the time. People in the United States, certainly Romanian Americans, and obviously others, and those people here are intensely interested in what is a seesaw situation. And um, I thank you just uh, for your, your stewardship, because I think you've handled it extremely well. I wish you well, and thanks for joining us again. Thank you all. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.